bunch of people here, so I don't think we're going to circle up. Um, so I think we should just get right to it. Let's, uh, David, we invited David to speak. I think that's the <coughs> year, right? Everyone's starting to get their gardens together. Uh, David wanted to present on uh, staple food crops. So you guys keep your bellies full. Yams. Going into the fall. Um, yams. Hello. Okay. Wherever you feel comfy. All right, cool. Yeah, that's uh, we're we're winging this, so I'm not a public speaker by any stretch. Um, this is uh, weird potatoes and beans to grow in your garden and to uh, feed yourself more than just some uh, fruit and kale. Um, I guess like quick kind of thing. Me, I've been down here for about 15 years. I've grown got into fruit trees, which progressed into permaculture things and stuff like that. In the last few years, I've been kind of focusing some of my efforts on growing uh, what I would call like staple crops, basically two kind of categories of that being calories and proteins uh, that you can grow relatively easy here. Um, my kind of list of picks of ones that I think do well down here, are, there's a handful that you can put in the worst soil possible here and grow a whole bunch of food. And there's some that are maybe a uh, a little more fun to grow or a little more, uh, you know, palatable or whatever you want to say like that, uh, that take a little bit of effort, but not that much effort and they're still easy and worth doing. Um, so just cause we're like limited time and I've made a big list and I realize it's probably more than what I can go over. Um, I'll kind of just break down as like, we'll talk about a species real quick or like a group of stuff. And then we'll go from basically how, when and where to plant them, how to harvest, how to select varieties on that types, and then how to process and store it. Cause with most staple crops, these are things that you're going to sit on or eat over the course of a year, rather than something that you're going to pick fresh and eat that day, or if not in the next hour after you pick it. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm eating potatoes that I grew last spring right now. So it's not... You know, I've got cassava flour that's from last year sitting around still. So there's a lot of things that are kind of cool that are more like a pantry item that you would think of rather than a fresh product necessarily. Uh, so we'll start off with cassava, I guess. Uh, cassava is also called yucca in a lot of the Caribbean. Uh, it is a bushy plant, basically, that'll get about 10 foot tall at the most. Um, it has a calorie rich, uh, uh, basically, root. Um, grows out from a uh, stalk, basically, that you're going to use as your planting material. So this isn't something that you're planting from seeds almost ever. They do make seeds every few years, but they're not worth planting because they have a lot of secondary chemistry that is not beneficial to human consumption. That you, ha you have to kind of just weed through as you go making selections on that. So it's a, something you grow from cuttings every year, basically. Uh, in central Florida, we are up against frost. You know, this year was a perfect example of we're up against frost every once in a while because we did have a couple solid days of, of cold weather. Um, so they're best planted uh, it, usually starting in March. Um, March kind of gets you past that last frost date. And if you select the right varieties, you have a nine to 10 month growing season that's all hot weather, that's them maxed out. Some people swear that you can grow them throughout the year, but if you get them to pull up roots, they got wood on the inside, but they, when they get mature, if they go through at least one winter. Um, so how with them? Brought some stocks with me. All the propagation material that I brought, I'm not taking back. So anybody that wants it, take it. Um, so with cassava, you're starting from sticks. And also this, a nice thing about cassava is that is something where you can take the worst sandy area in your yard and get a yield of food out of it without doing any amending or anything like that. That being said, when I do plant cassava, um, I usually pasture my chickens in that spot first. So there is some nitrogen in the soil, regardless of if it's sandy or not. Um, over fertilization or kind of loving them a little bit more tends to yield a lot less. I don't need to cut it up. Well, because if, if I want to give this away and if you start cutting it up, it starts drying out. Okay. So whoever takes this, take it whole, you know. Um, so with them, uh, with cassava, it's, it's propagated by cuttings, basically. And with a cutting on these, usually you pick from this is the ground end. That's the formerly in the air end. Usually you pick about eight to ten nodes. And there's, you can argue about this with people online all day about how you're supposed to plant it, but usually what I do is just take a pickaxe, put a hole about 45 degrees in the ground, and you bury the bottom ones. So each node is going to yield either a stalk that grows up leaves or roots that grow out the bottom. Um, also, because they put out the first roots that come out of these are your storage roots eventually. So 
not something you want to like put in a pot and then like plant later because <laughs> you'll get a lot of cassava roots with 90 degree angles in them. And uh, it, it's, it's fine to eat, but it's a real pain when it gets to the kitchen. You got to peel something with a, an armpit basically. Um, so uh, you cut these up uh, starting in March, like I was saying, um, and then you plant them. Uh, you water them for the first couple uh, weeks till they get rooted in. They'll put out, cut, uh, put out uh, new sprouts at each one. They usually end up with like one or two. Um, if you plant them real dense, they get bushier, but they also get a lower yield on them. So you do want to space them out about three to four foot. Um, I do them at a, on a bias usually. And then also, because we're a permaculture group and we try to do things that are a little more integrated, this is something that takes eight months minimum to grow. Uh, up to a 10, 10, 11. That's a lot of time for a spot in your garden, especially if it's a small yard or something like that, where you're not obtaining any yield whatsoever. You're basically just waiting for this thing to grow out. Um, so what I usually do is after these have, so we're, we'll integrate this one into more of a permaculture thing. We pasture chickens on this to kind of clear the soil of weeds and everything like that. We plant our cassava. After we get a couple sprouts that get a, you know, close to a foot tall, then in between all these, we interplant with cowpeas. Uh, cowpeas is a quick yielding thing. And also what I'll do sometimes is plant a vining type. Uh, they, they act as a smother ground cover basically. And by the time they're getting done, they're getting shaded out by the cassava. So it works out beautifully. It's two crops in one spot. And uh, it's a pretty, pretty effective way that I've found over, probably done that the last four or five years pretty consistently. Um, shorter ones or half vining varieties work best because they act as a ground cover better than the complete vining ones. Uh, so these are the type of cowpeas that you could find at any feed store around here for you know a big giant bag of them. Or you go to the grocery store and get a pound of uh, black eyed peas and do the same exact thing. Um, so with cassava, like, like I was saying, it's, it is a big, giant, potato-y type of root. Um, after that eight, nine, ten months, whatever it takes, some varieties are a little longer, some are a little bit shorter. Um, a lot of, I've met a lot of people from the Caribbean that have varieties that are longer season. They're delicious, but they're not good for here because they don't deal with the cold, and they can plant them all year when it's in a little more tropical location. So we have to kind of take that into consideration when we start planting these things in the subtropics or warm temperate, which is really what we are here. Um, so these, you take your cuttings, plant them out. Uh, they make a root mass. Uh, this variety that I have, this is all a commercial variety from Brazil called CMC40. Um, it's a standard issue, regular one. It's the same one that you would see at the grocery store or Latin grocery store or something like that. Um, yield tends to be around 15 to 20 pounds a plant. The most that I've ever had is 35. Um, so if you extrapolate that out, that's a lot of food in a very small area. Um, Great thing about that, uh, so uh, variety selection, like I said, pick ones that are shorter variety. Um, I'm not a great source for a lot of cassava. Uh, Josh Jameson with Cody Co Farm uh, has a ton of varieties. And he's probably somebody that you, I'm gonna sell a handful of these in season, but I'm gonna run out the first day that I put them up on the website. So I'm not gonna, <laughs> I'm not gonna be like a, a fantastic source for these because I don't have the, I don't have acres and acres of land to work with. Um, uh, varieties, CMC40, uh, he has one called Togo that's very good. Um, and there's some yellow flesh varieties um, that he has as well. I have them. I've gr I grew them out for propagation material this year. I didn't save them for roots because I planted them real compact because all I wanted was sticks for next year, basically. Um, so we got that. So we got our how. We got our when to plant and harvest varieties, and then processing. The big thing that stinks about cassava is when you pull it out of the ground, you basically got a day and a half before it goes bad. So what does that allow, what, what do you do to keep that sticking around for a year basically? Um, you can do a couple things. You can pull the roots, wash them off, peel them, cut them up in small pieces, the you know, usable size pieces that you're gonna use right off the bat, throw them in uh, vacuum bags and freeze them. That's the easiest thing to do as far as preserving them for long periods of time. If you're going to eat them as whole roots, um, you have to boil them. They have a secondary chemistry that's toxic until they're cooked all the way. So they do have to be boiled. And if you're going to make like French fries or yuca frita out of them, um, you're going to have to boil them ahead of time. About 20 minutes is usually what I do. All of these are what are called sweet varieties. Bitter varieties are the ones that have more of that secondary chemistry. And uh, they're uncommon here. So if you're going to pick them up from people that know the actual varieties that they have, you're probably not going to encounter them. Um, but those are ones that are extremely hardy. Like those will 
never get disease. These don't get disease to begin with. There's not enough of a monocrop industry of this to have the pests that do affect them in some countries. Um, so it is kind of nice in that sense as far as like they're disease free pretty much completely. There's a moth that does eat the leaves. Um, I get it every once in a while, but it doesn't do enough damage to even matter at all. Um, and then with, so with, uh, with uh, processing and storage, so you can make, uh, what I do with most of mine is I make flour out of them. So if you wanna grow something that you can easily without any additional fancy equipment or anything like that that you wouldn't have as a gardener that's a little more on the serious side, you can do all your processing easily um, with kind of like home equipment. So what I usually do with I, if I make flour out of these, I'll take, um, take the roots, cut them up, throw them in the food processor so they're shredded, and then dehydrate them. Uh, we talked about cooking ahead of time uh, before you eat them. By the time you process them, now, now my eyes are gonna adjust for like five minutes because my eyes are very slow to adjust. Um, so uh, by the time you cook, or you're not cooking them, but you're dehydrating them, which is warming them for a long time, as a fine shred, they are ready to go right off the bat. You don't have to additionally cook them. Also, you're making flour. You're going to cook, cook or bake it anyway. Um, so uh, that's really what's really nice. So you um, take your roots, peel them. Uh, I'll actually ferment them for a day in a five gallon bucket. They uh, helps break them down a little bit. You don't have to do that though. So basically you chunk them up, grind them in a food processor. Or you can take like, if you're just doing a couple roots, just take a box grater, grind them up freeze them it right from there. Uh, you can store them frozen like that, or what I do is dehydrate the shreds. And then when you need flour, I have a grain mill that I just run them through, or you can just take a high powered blender and just make your flour from that. Um, leave them in the, so the shreds, uh, and then if you can, take your shreds and um, use like a vacuum sealer or something like that to get the oxygen out of there, and they will last a long, long, long time, especially so the shreds. Uh, if you grind them up into flour, the flour goes bad just like regular wheat flour after a while because it has more surface area. So um, if you're going to make, if you want to grow your own bread or something like that, this is probably the way to go. It's a gluten-free flour, which means you're not going to make like a delicious sourdough loaf out of it, but you can make killer flatbreads. I make pandabono, which is basically a cheese bread out of it a lot. Um, it's, it's, it's a unique flour. It's good. It does have its utility, but it doesn't, it's not wheat flour. So it, it is a little different in that sense. Um, so that's cassava. Also has edible leaves, but you have to boil them for a very long time. Um, kind of like a chaya type situation. Um, I've never eaten them because I have, you know, 30 other greens that I'd rather eat besides something that I have to boil for 25 minutes. Um, so that's kind of why I haven't ever bothered with that. So that's, that's cassava. And um, my favorite potato or potato adjacent thing to grow is just regular potatoes. Um, this is the time of year to plant regular potatoes. Um, basically, we have a window from October to about mid-February to plant regular potatoes. Um, I've always, gr I've grown them for the last few years pretty consistently. Last year I did a big planting of them and I went, I don't know if I wanna mess around with some of these other weird <laughs> crops because I didn't really do just like a regular potato. It's kind of nice to have. Um, with potatoes, there's some, uh, so the when is basically over the winter. The problem is most potatoes are planted from seed potatoes, which is just a pre-chilled, tuber that you cut up, let dry out, and then plant. You can get them, um, if you want organic, there's a place called Grand Teton Organics, they're in Idaho. Um, and there's a place called Wood Prairie up in Maine that you can get them from. You buy them, you split them up, and then you plant them. The problem is from a permaculture perspective is it's not always the easiest thing to really cycle and continue going with that. Also, it, it is a solanum, so it does have solanum disease pressure too, just like tomatoes do. Um, so they're not the most like one that you can really kind of keep going forever, but you can do them for a while. Uh, the problem is seed storage over the summer. If you have like an extra fridge that you can keep them in the forties at, they do just fine. You just pull them out in September, let them start growing eyes and then you cut them up again. Um, <clears throat> as far as variety selection for here, because we are 
growing them in the winter and we don't have a long, mild growing season, we have a short winter, um, you want to pick varieties just like tomatoes that are determinate. So that means they form all their potatoes at one time um, instead of just continuously growing. So you see a lot of like viral stuff online that's like plant a potato in a bag with this and then you keep growing and it doesn't, that doesn't work for this type of potato. They all make them all at once. It's not going to continuously make potatoes up a uh, stalk if you keep piling uh, material on them. Um, so varieties that work well for here are generally ones that are going to be more like a red creamer type potato. Uh, dark red Norland is super, super disease tolerant. And that's the variety that I found that I can pull out in April, throw on a, sh a wire rack in the kitchen and then plant again in the fall. Uh, so even if you're buying seed potatoes, which is a pretty considerable expense for something that is just so simple as potatoes, um, you can get at least two rounds out of them. Um, I'm experimenting with seven other varieties this year too. I'll post them on my site if I find any that are really great. Um, basically with them though, it's that determinant style short season. So short season for potatoes is like 85 to 90 days. Um, and that allows them to be in and out before it gets too hot. If you plant them this time of the year or in the beginning of the fall, it allows you to get them out before we get our first frost in the year too. Um, there's one other variety that's kind of unique and I've had good success with if you don't want to buy seed potatoes is there's a variety called Clancy. It's a hybrid. It is an actual seed grown potato. So you grow it from an actual seed. Um, they're available every seed, uh, seeds and such carries them and a handful of other like the big seed companies do have them. Uh, you start them in flats just like you would a regular vegetable. You plant them out and they make a small waxy potato. They're about 50-50 red and white skin. They're very, very good. Um, that's kind of good if you don't want to track down seed potatoes. Um, the next weird potato is uh, true yams. So here, a lot of people think yams, they actually think sweet potatoes. True yams are a totally unrelated spe uh, group of species. The, that make a, well, I, I got a big one here. So they're, 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 that's a little one. So that's a little one. So there's uh, true, true yams are a vining plant. Um, if you're familiar with the air potato, it's the same genus of plant. Um, so they are a vertical climbing vine that makes a large starchy root. Um, this variety is a, a yellow yam, which is real popular in the Caribbean, uh, Dioscoria rotundata. I think that's right. Uh, the easier one to grow is this one here, and it's a little more manageable. This is Dioscoria alata, or the winged yam. Those are the ones that if you see the purple ones called ube, uh, that's an ube type. This is a white flesh ube, basically. Um, another big starchy root, um, varieties. A lot is easier to prop propagate. Rotundata is a pain in the butt. This one I'm taking back with me <laughs> because the, they're, they're difficult to propagate in mass. Like basically I have a handful of these in the yard. I cut the top off. I just replant it and I get one back out. I've never been able to really grow out the amount that I have available. Um, because this variety only grows from the top end. They have like a, like a marist, apical meristem basically. Uh, the winged yams, you can just chunk up like a regular potato and plant them out. And they also make bull bills, which uh, if you're familiar with air potatoes, they make the little air potatoes that grow up in the trees. They, this does that too. And you can use that as propagation material, but you get smaller potatoes, which to be totally honest with yams, a smaller one's not a bad thing. Um, I grew an ube a couple years ago that was 70 pounds. Um, it, it went to waste because it was so huge and unmanageable and it had grown in amongst other roots and all kinds of stuff like that. It was just, it ended up getting trashed for the most part. Um, so uh, you can grow them and let them sit in the ground like that and they get bigger and bigger and bigger and they get more and more unmanageable too. So uh, because they have almost an invasive uh, characteristic to them because they're such a fast reproducer, I do like treating them as a, like a, a vegetable in a garden. Not, they're not a food forest plant because I let them do the food forest thing and I've been tearing them out of the food forest for the last three years. Um, and they just get out of hand. It's not, it seems irresponsible basically because they can spread to other places and that's not something that we ever want to do. Um, so varieties on them, a lot is pretty good as far as being easy. Um, there's other ones. If you go to a Caribbean grocery store, you can plant any of them. So you can mess around with some other ones. Um, I've grown a handful of other weird varieties that do better up north. There's one that makes little tiny pea-like potatoes all over the vines. 
um, but it doesn't reproduce well, so I don't really recommend it for down here. There's one called Yompia that's really good, but again, it's I got one season, I got a season and a half out of them really because they kind of faltered in the summer or in the summer, so I don't think that was a good variety. Rotundata, Cayenneensis, and then the a lot is pretty good as far as that. Um, so cool thing about yams is they have a unbeatable biological clock. They will only sprout in the spring. So you can leave these on your counter and once a, once a side shoot comes flying out of them and it comes, it'll be like, oh, there's a little piece. And then it's three feet and grab it onto your kitchen counter. It's like, it, it's really fast and really, really, all they want to do is grow. Um, so, and then you can chunk them up. Um, the generally what's, how most people do these, what they call it like a mini set style propagation. With the Alata, you can break up all different pieces and it'll grow out all different spots. Um, you just take them and just like you would like a seed potato, you want to kind of let that, that scar up before you plant it. Uh, the easiest thing that I found, I found a video from Ghana a while back where it's like a major crop. Uh, they just take campfire ash because it's a, it's a sanitizing uh, chemical basically. So all that I'll do is I'll chunk them up and I'll just go over to my fire ring, throw them all in there, roll them around the ashes and then plant them the same exact day. Um, very, very easy. Um, they have that basically that same um, kind of thing as the cassava where they're going to be done in the winter. They have a senescence period on the vines, so it's not like you're like, oh, I wonder if I can pick them yet. What happens with them is they grow up all summer, and then as the vines start to senesce down, which means they start breaking down basically, all the energy that's in those vines basically just reforms back into the tuber. So if you go in the middle of summer and you start poking around and you're like, oh, these are going to be huge and they're going to like dig up, like dig up one early, there's not going to be a tuber there because that tuber forms as they senesce down. So you will might find like some little thing, you're like, oh, I've totally screwed this thing up. This is not grown at all. And it, then it becomes a nice big tuber. These at a year when they're like this, like four or five pound size are really nice and manageable. Like I said, you can let them grow on the ground for two years, but they get out of hand and they are just difficult to work with. These are kind of nice. Uh, this is a variety I got from Jay Reynolds down in, in Pine Island. And it's tends to, uh, some of the varieties tend to make lobes. So they're, they're not like a nice potato shape. They're kind of like lumpy and they get dirt in little crevices and they'll get rot in them and stuff. And I really don't care for them. So this variety I really like a lot. Um, don't grow a ton of them. They're not our favorite. Um, I will say the flower out of them is a killer pancake flower because they got a little, they don't have gluten, but they do have a mucilage to them. So if you cook them flat like that, they make a pretty great pancake. And if you make them out of ube, they end up purple, which is kind of fun. Um, so I, I kind of do like them. Um, the last kind of major, what I would call major, uh, kind of more like calorie crop thing is the major calorie crop of the world, corn. Uh, dent corn, not sweet corn. Um, if you've only grown sweet corn, uh, dent corn is growing corn on easy mode. Uh, because it is not a, <laughs> it is not a grain grass that has been forced into growing a fruit, basically, which is what sweet corn is. Uh, dent corn is kind of nice as far as uh, it's the most efficient space-wise maker of food that exists. That's why it's the basis for our economy, food or otherwise. <laughs> so um, it it it. People get scared, oh, like, oh, corn's hard in Florida. It's not, there's just a couple considerations. Uh, just like the potatoes, it, it's not the one that you're gonna put in the sandy spot. It's the one that you're gonna put in the best part of your garden because they are hungry, hungry plants, a lot of high nitrogen fertilizer or do chickens again, like I was saying before. Um, but uh, with dent corns, so there's more like, it's funny because it's like, oh, you Traditional dent corns are ones that you would like grow up north uh, well, uh, the variety that I brought with me. I don't work with this strain anymore, so if anybody wants it, take it. That is a uh, trucker's favorite white, great tortilla corn. Um, it's one that doesn't fare super good in the summer because it's a northern corn, basically. So this one you start this time of the year, and before the rains start, they're out, basically. There's a whole other set of genetics called tropical corns, which you can plant as soon as the rain starts and then you harvest them in the fall. So you never have to water them. Uh, corn's a water hog, so it's kind of a nice thing to not have to water. That's the variety that I'm, uh, variety that I'm working with now is uh, originally from Zimbabwe and I'm selecting out uh, so it grows two ears per plant and it only gets about six foot tall. Some of the dent corns will get 12 foot tall. Uh, they're big. Um, there's a variety that's heirloom to Florida that apparently does good. I've never grown uh, called hickory cane. 
Uh, it's from North Florida. It's a native variety, actually. Um, so corn, if it's, if it's a northern variety planet now, um, ton of fertilizer, ton of water. It is high input. Um, very much not, in most situations, a permaculture plant. The tropical ones, I think you can kind of work into a system that's a little more low input, easier. Um, I do like growing it because I like tortillas and I like grits and stuff like that. Um, to make tortillas, you nixtamalize, which is how to make the uh, make them safe and also makes them like a complete protein or whatever to, uh, I guess. Now, you can't, there, there's no one here that can get their hands on GMO anything. It's a, non, it's a non-issue, it's a marketing standpoint for organic companies to say, oh, it's non-GMO. You have to pay a lot to get GMO stuff, basically. You're not, we're not commodity farmers, we're not buying our seed by the pallet. It's not gonna be something that we're ever going to encounter as home gardeners. So, yeah. Uh, selecting them for, is just normal hybridization. That's not, yeah, that's uh, Trucker's Favorites OP. So you can save that corn forever. If you don't want to select it, just save it as is, and it'll just kind of go and go and go and make basically the same stuff every year. Um, yeah, GM corn is not something that any of us are ever going to be in contact with unless there's a commodity farmer here sneaking into the permaculture stuff. <laughs> so uh, and that's fine too. You know, we're all we all we all do our own thing, right? Um, so uh, dent, dent corn, I grow it on drip tape in my vegetable garden, like intensive vegetable gar uh, vegetable crop, basically because it does need, like I said, a lot of water, a lot of fertilizer. That's the downside of it. Um, but the upside is per the space that you use, it's the almost one of the most amount of food that you can get out of that space, uh, which is kind of cool. Um, you, each plant will basically make a pound of, pound of flour uh, if, if you grow it right. So you th you're, not, you're not planting five corn plants, you're planting a few hundred. So um, it has to be planted in blocks for, for, uh, for uh, uh, pollination reasons. It's wind pollinated. It's a grass. So um, most people that plant corn are going to be planting them four to five rows wide and usually about 20, 30 foot blocks, something like that. So it's not something for, you got a couple raised beds in the backyard. It's probably not your best call um, as far as taking up garden space. But if you do have some space, it is a really nice thing to grow. Um, the one, two, actually two, Two types of pests, six-legged and four-legged pests with corn. Uh, six-legged uh, caterpillars love. There's a handful of uh, borers that get into them. So if you're comfortable using some organic uh, pesticides like BT or, or spinosad, um, that really keeps them going without having to do much else. Um, and four-legged, um, there's a point in dent corn where it's basically sweet corn for a few days. Uh, that is raccoon candy. Um, so you got to fight off raccoons for a couple weeks there, but while they're, while they're kind of maturing into hard corn, um, that's the one downside of it. I do tend to lose some to it and then I start trapping them and it's less of an issue. So again, out of all the kind of calorie crop ones, it is a little more work, but it, it is in my mind, at least it's worth it. Um, Minor crops, uh, like calorie crops, ones that I don't focus on quite as much because it's just me. It's not like they're bad or anything like that. I've either had less success with them or I find them to be a little bit lower yielding or need a little more considerations that I'm not willing to give essentially what is another weird potato. Um, sweet potatoes, uh, most people have luck with them. I don't. Um, for the amount of space they take up, I find the yield is pretty low. Uh, easy to grow, obviously. Um, the other one's uh, taro. Uh, taro is, needs a little bit more water. There's some varieties you can grow dry land. Um, I put in a big, I put in a few hundred last year and I grew them out and I felt like the yield wasn't worth it. So I, I don't know how much I really want to recommend them. Um, there is some people that are working with better varieties that have had some success with them. Um, an another one that if you have more of like a food forest setup and you like the idea of planting something permanently and not having to do all this like replanting and all the heavy work, uh, Malanga, also called Yaltia, um, is basically an elephant ear type thing like um, taro, but it really does well when you just plant it once. Um, so what I do with them is like on the outside of a row of fruit trees or something like that, part shade, you know, moist soil, a lot of mulch and everything like that. Uh, you can plant them out. They grow basically like an elephant ear. And how the uh, the tuber forms on them is they grow kind of out off of a main tuber. 
so you can periodically harvest them. And confirmed by somebody that I talked to from Puerto Rico a while back, they're like, yeah, nobody replants these. Just It's like a one and done kind of thing. And compared to a lot of the other stuff, that's the only one that I found that you can really do that with um, long term. And then just every few years, you dig up the main one, break it up, and uh, replant it. Um, that probably out of all of the non-potato potatoes is the most potato-like one of them. If you like like a russet baking potato, uh, Yautia or uh, Malanga, same interchangeable name, um, that's probably the most potato, like a soft baking potato type flavor. Um, I'm not culturally familiar with it, so I just kind of use it like a potato. I know it has a lot of other uses. Um, but I do enjoy them when we do have them. I just don't grow a ton of them, but I do have a little bit and I, I do look forward to eating them when we dig them up. Um, other grains that I've messed around with that are, I haven't quite perfected yet are uh, sorghum and millet. Uh, sorghum, my, my it, uh, interest is mainly as a chicken feed supplement. So um, there's some perennial sorghums too. So I want to mess around with them, but I haven't got that like enough yield out of them to go like, yeah, it's definitely a staple. Like it's worth taking up a ton of space with. Um, amaranth falls in that category too. It's a, it's a grain. That's not a grain kind of like how quinoa is. Um, processing amaranth is like trying to sift sand though, because the seeds are very, very, very small. And I kind of just don't have time. I don't want to like, they're just not appealing. Um, and then the other thing that um, I've grown a little bit on and off, I've grown it like a few years and then I haven't. And same thing where it's like the yield isn't exactly what I would consider fantastic, but it is another thing that works well into like a food forest type system is called African potato mint. Um, it is in the mint family. It just makes a storage tuber that's just like a little potato. It makes a great ground cover too. I think as, if you do like banana circles or something like that, where like you have areas that stay like somewhat consistently moist, and they don't like get a direct, direct sun. I think it's a fantastic ground cover, even if you never eat it. Um, so another one to pick up. I saw Lonnie back there. You got potato mint, right? Yeah, yeah, I was gonna say, I was, I was gonna say, I was up a while back, you got a ton of that stuff. Um, and uh, so on to protein, beans, bas dry beans basically, not green beans or anything, not long beans, anything like that. Beans that you can dry and save, hold on to, eat, a year and a half after you pick them. Uh, first and foremost, the absolute easiest, easiest, easiest one to grow is pigeon peas. Uh, pigeon peas is basically a small tree. You can think of it as what I would call like a short-term perennial. Basically, you're gonna get a few years out of them. Um, you can let them go a few years longer if we don't have frost for a while, but um, with pigeon peas, they tend to get very leggy, they get out of hand, but they're like very, very, very multi-use compared to a lot of these other things where you're basically just getting a yield out of a lot of this stuff. Pigeon peas are a lot more multi-functional, basically. Um, I like planting them on site. Uh, some people plant them in containers first. I just like planting them where they're gonna grow. They grow up, um, you start them this time of the year, basically you want as long of a season as possible because you want them to max out their size. 99% of varieties of pigeon peas are what are called day length uh, sensitive, which means they only start flowering during short days of the either the very early spring or the, or, or the end of the fall. So central Florida can be tough for pigeon peas as far as getting a ton of yield out of them if we have freezes. This year, pigeon peas kind of a loss, you know, uh, for the most part. Um, so they flower and then they will make a just like a bean comes on the tree. I uh, wish I had one in a pot. I don't, I just don't put them in pots ever. So I don't have one that I could show you. Um, but so they, they, they they grow like a small tree and um, they, they flower, they make a bean. You can pick it at the green stage, but the, uh, the pods are uh, infuriating to get into, but you can like steam them and eat them like edamame early. But I like them just as a dry bean. So I let them go completely dry on the plant and uh, use them just basically like you would lentils. I guess it would be like the closest adjacent kind of thing like that. Uh, they do have to be cooked for a while. I got an instant pot a while back. That makes it very nice and easy because it takes only about 20 minutes in an instant pot. Um, so they're, uh, they're a really solid, easy dry bean. And what's nice about them being multi-use is after you harvest them or after the frost gets them, they are a chop and drop plant for sure. They're in the Fabaceae family, so they fix nitrogen, so they do make a pretty decent amount of biomass too. So usually what I'll do is plant them on the outside edge of a full sun section of fruit trees, 
uh, let them grow up, let them mature. <clears throat> and then if we don't have a frost, cut them back in the spring so they're not as, as they're more bushy and a lot less tree-like because they will get pretty dang big. Um, there is some varieties that are day less day length sensitive uh, that you can grow like in the Northeast, like they're, you can grow them other places. I've had another, I grew another, what's supposed to be a day neutral variety. I found them to be kind of weak and not worth it. So I, uh, I don't know. I kind of like just the regular ones that get huge. Um, ton of yield on them. You'll get, you know, I take, I usually store them in like half gallon, uh, uh, you know, like canning jars and you get a few per tree uh, on a good year if we don't get those early freezes because you'll have that maturity period that's happening hopefully before we get freezes. So those December freezes can really wreck them every once in a while. Um, the second more like bean type thing are cow peas, um, also called field peas. Sometimes they're uh, native to Africa. They are a tropical uh, vine, basically bean vine. Um, there's a few types of them too. Most of them have been in, in the US at least have been bred into basically an annual vegetable. They're short season. They grow, you get your, pe your beans off of them. You can pick them early as like a shell stage bean, but if you want them as like a, 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 a dry bean, you have to do let them dry completely. So there's some of those, oh, that's, there's a pigeon pea, yes. <laughs> I went past pigeon pea, but it's all right, yeah. Yeah, so, that, so they flower, this, th these were protected, right? Because all mine are uh, very sad right now. So, um, so yeah, so there's your, be your beans on there. They mature, they get about that long. Usually get about four to four to six per pod. Um, and then as far as like threshing them, usually what I'll do is if you do let them dry out all the way, just throw them all in a pillowcase and you get a nice solid surface like this and just smash them until they all break up. And then you just winnow out all the, uh, all the seed pods out of there and just end up with just your beans. Uh, you just put them in front of a fan, kind of shake them out and all the dust blows off of them basically and then just store them. Um, cow peas, you do the same thing. Um, so a lot of the annual, like the more like modern, I guess you could say cowpeas are more set to be picked as like at that, what they call like a shelly stage. So they're not totally dry. Um, they're smaller plants. They're easier to pick. Um, and they don't store quite as well. You have to freeze them. You can't just store them dry or anything like that. But they're, they're nice. They're good, but they're like kind of like halfway to being a really true bean. Uh, the varieties that I like for long-term storage are uh, the tropical types. They're a huge vine. Um, they take their day length uh, triggered blooming so they don't, you put them in this time of the year, they take over a section of your food forest. They climb into 12 feet up, 15 foot, foot up into your trees. They grow a trunk like a dang grapevine. And um, then once they're huge and covering a large area, then they all bloom and you get a pretty hefty yield off of them. Uh, the variety that I like the most is this one called a Puerto Rican, uh, black crowder. So if you like black beans, but you found black beans to be kind of a pain to, uh, to pick, these are black beans that you can grow here. So they're, uh, and these, and what's nice about this variety is they have a really heavy, um, seed pod. So this will make a dry bean in August when it's raining every day. So those other types of cow peas are going to get wrecked by that, especially if you want to grow them as a dry bean. This variety, for whatever reason, is like impervious to a lot of, uh, you know, pest issues and, and fungus and stuff like that. And then they're just like a regular dry bean that you would use. You soak them for a while and then cook them back to the instant pot. They cook real fast in there and I kind of like doing that. It's just a pressure cooker, really. Um, what? This one? Puerto Rican Black Crowder is the name that I found it under. Um, Crowder peas are the, what they call, are some of the ones that if you look, they're kind of squared off. I mean, not exactly something everybody can see, but they're rectangle. They're not round and they're crowder because they're crowded in the bean. That's what that kind of name comes from. That's my understanding at least. Um, but I'd like these tropical varieties, but they're not one. What's up? Is that like <coughs> brown crowder cow peas? Yeah, same exact thing. That, so that, that's just a different variety. Um, I've grown one called Dixie Lee that's kind of like that, kind of in the middle of the road. I don't really care for it either way. Um, but this is just one that's a bigger, it doesn't have the wild taken out of it, which is why it's a lot hardier, basically. Um, the ones that are more adapted to further north from here, like I said, that are more like an annual type thing, 
they're not day length triggered at all. You can start them now. You can st you can push them into the fall sometimes too, but it's like that's when we're doing all our other vegetable gardening. A lot of this stuff grows real nice in the summer when we don't want to be out there anyway. Uh, if you notice, the yam grows in the summer, the cassava grows in the summer, the tropical corn grows in the summer. There's a theme there of I don't want to be out there and I want something that I can throw in my fridge at the end of the summer or throw in the dehydrator or whatever at the end of the summer and I have that all yanked out so I can start doing vegetables over the winter. Uh, which is kind of nice. You know, I do a little bit of vegetables in the uh, summer, but um, a huge section of my garden anymore is the, is the staple stuff over the summer because a lot of it is set and forget. A lot of its stuff smothers weeds on its own, like cassava or things like that, or sweet potato. If you do that, that tends to be a pretty decent ground cover too. Um, cowpeas are an excellent ground cover and they're a nitrogen fixer. Um, on to the next one that I've moved into a little more the last few years, and it's just because like you, it's like something you don't think of, but it's like, duh, uh, peanuts. Uh, peanuts are incredibly easy to grow. And I, like, I've on and off grown them for years, but like the last couple years I've done a lot, and it's like, these are so easy, like why, why not do it? So, um, uh, Southern Exposure Seed Company, they're up in Virginia, they have a whole ton of different heirloom uh, peanuts, which you can save seed on. I've grown some commercial varieties and I've grown some heirlooms and they both grow just as well. So it's like, do the ones that you can save seeds on, right? Um, uh, peanuts, you can start, they're, they're a longer season. They like it hot. They uh, don't really care about soil moisture except for in the very, very beginning. Uh, I like to start them in like May when all your other vegetables are out of the way. And the time of the year where you're gonna go, like I wanna put a cover crop anyway, why not do a cover crop that you can get a yield out of too? Uh, peanuts are a nitrogen fixer because they're in the pea family, just like everything else that we were talking about on the kind of the protein side of it. Um, pretty high yielding for the space too. Um, like surprisingly high yield for the space, to be honest. Um, runner types are nice because they'll cover the ground pretty consistently. And then in the process of harvesting them, you're breaking off all those rhizobius roots. So you're kind of, you're gaining that, 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 that nitrogen fixation too in the summer, which is pretty nice. And it's like, there's so many of those uh, cover crops that like you can grow over the summer that are perfectly fine, but you're not getting a yield out of them either. Um, also found out that you can pressure can boiled peanuts. And uh, that was kind of a game changer too. <laughs> Cause I've got like a whole shelf of boiled peanuts that I can just dump a can into a pot and heat up. And it's, uh, it's kind of nice to have that, to be honest. Um, but you have to pressure can them, you can't do them water bath. Um, so yeah, peanuts, I think I'm gonna kind of do more of that. Like I was uh, talking about earlier about sweet potatoes. I don't really get like a fantastic yield. I'll grow a little bit of sweet potatoes, but I'm gonna really focus on peanuts as a combination cover crop and, you know, make some peanut butter. You know, like it's, it's, it's a pretty, pretty nice thing to have. Um, minor kind of bean crops that I've either experimented with a little bit or don't have a huge yield yet that I haven't figured out or you're just not gonna want as quite as many. Uh, lima beans, uh, lima beans are great. Uh, you can grow them out to the shell, past the shell stage. Like most people wanna pick them when they're at that green stage because they taste good, but you can grow them out to the shell stage. There are some perennial varieties of lima beans. So if you wanna include them in more of a food forest setup and plant them and let them go for four or five years and just get yield off of them all the time, that's an option too. Um, there's bush ones and there's pole ones. Pole ones seem to grow a lot, make a lot more per the space. So I would kind of err on that side. Um, regular dry beans. So the bush bean that you get like green beans from, there's other varieties of them that are made to be picked at the dry bean stage. The problem is they need a little bit warmer temperature, so you're not gonna be growing them over the winter in central Florida. So you kind of have to find ones that are in, in in like late February, early March, and then are out before it starts raining. And to get dry beans in that period is tough. Uh, talking about Josh from Cody Cove, he gave me a bunch that I grew together and I've been kind of growing them out, but I haven't like, I haven't dedicated enough garden space to start eating them yet. So I'm just like growing out for seed continuously and kind of just selecting the varieties out of that mix that are doing well. Uh, I'm gonna, it's more of a hobby thing. I don't think that's something I'm ever gonna really rely on a whole lot. Um, and then the other thing that I'm messing around with this year, um, working food in Gainesville has a tepary bean, which is a, that's the, the staple bean from the American Southwest. So typically a variety of bean, it's a different species than regular beans. Um, typically something that likes very dry weather and they've grown them up in Gainesville 
and get dry beans in the all summer with them. So that's something I'm, I'm experimenting with too and I'd love to grow out a bunch of them and, and really mess around with them too. So that's an option as well. What's the name of that I'm just, I've only gardened in Florida. So like when there's like stuff from like other parts of the country, it's like very alien, but there's probably people who gardened in Arizona and New Mexico are like, yeah, duh, like tepary beans, of course, you know, it's just not something I'm super familiar with. Um, that's it. Anybody got questions? I blew through that and I don't know if anything sunk in. Hopefully something sunk in. I'm not a public speaker, so I'm sorry if I, yeah. Just where did you purchase the black beans? Black beans, uh, take them with you. Take some, yeah. Um, Ke uh, Kelly and Ryan see the stars. They sell them. The yeah, and then I'm um, pretty sure Cody Cove does too. Um, my original ones I got from a nursery in Puerto Rico that I just got them shipped up. Uh, that, that's that's that was actually the nursery that I got the day length neutral pigeon pea from. It was less than stellar. And actually, Kelly and Ryan are messing with a day neutral pigeon pea too. So, but they said the seeds real small. It's like pigeon peas are small enough. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how much smaller they can be, you know. Um, like I said, anything that you can't find or anything like that, um, please take these ube, take these pigeon pea seeds, take that corn. I'm not that, that's Trucker's favorite white. It's a great corn, but I'm starting to select on my other one, and I only have an acre, and I only have about 5,000 square feet of garden, so I'm trying to do commodity crops on a very, very, very small piece of land, so I can't mess around with too many of certain things. That's the first uh, dent corn that I ever grew, and it grew amazing, but I'm just trying to select out of this other run that I'm working with right now. Uh, practicalplantsfl.com. I don't sell any of that. <laughs> uh, no, I kind of focus, I focus on a little bit of everything. Practicalplantsfl.com. So about a year ago, I started selling stuff. Um, more focused on fruit trees, herbs, perennial vegetables, things like that. A lot of the staple stuff, I don't, like I was kind of joking about, I don't have the space to grow out a ton of it. And I really minus, except for like a handful of annual things that I sell over the winter, I'm focusing on stuff that I can produce myself. So I, I want to be able to say to whoever picks up stuff from me, yes, I grew it, it's doing great. You can grow it in 9B Central Florida, no problem. And I don't have any hesitation and I'm not just dragging stuff up from Miami like everyone else. So it's hopefully something that di differentiates me from, from other stuff. There's nothing wrong with doing that because I buy a ton of stuff like that for myself, but it's not just stuff that I want to sell, so. Yeah, I'm right next to the winery. Oh, I remember you. Oh, yeah, you've been over, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Sorry, I, I get, like, face blindness or something, I guess. I always like, oh, yeah, we have met before. I'm talking to people like I've never talked to them before. Ugh, that's bad. Yes, I'm just going down the row. <laughs> I did that. Yeah. So if you're going to, if you're going to do like a, I mean, I kind of did it. Yeah. I did three sisters cause I put seminal bumpkins at the end of it. I did that a couple of times. Um, if you're going to do like a three sisters thing, remember it's three sisters that you harvest at the same time. It's not zucchini that you pick while you're going through green beans to get to sweet. It's that's not how it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be a plant at once, pick it all at the end. Everything's dry and died down at the end. Um, if you're going to do like the subtropical three sisters, dent corn, uh, the really tall dent corns would be fantastic, like hickory cane that get like 12 foot tall. Um, Semi-vining cowpeas are the best ones for that because the problem is if you interplant cowpeas with corn and your corn is growing well, it's going to get way taller than you think compared to some of the less vining cowpeas. So when I did them two years ago, I guess, um, I did Trucker's Favorite. I did a cow pea called Hercules, which makes like a, almost the size of a chickpea uh, cow pea that's like semi-vining. It's not quite as aggressive as the, the, the Puerto Rican black beans will like eat everything you put over them. Um, I grow them up like a stretch of, uh, of, um, of uh, fruit trees in the front. I'm on a sand hill, so it is like barren, dry clay sand up there and they grow just fine. I grew them in my vegetable garden to try to grow out a whole bunch of seed and I babied them and I got a very pathetic yield off of them because the plants were happy. They didn't have to flower or do anything. They just kept growing and growing and growing. And and, and I literally I literally took, I grew them on, a, on, on just like fence and the vines were so dense, I just cut everything off and then just like, 
rolled it up with the vines still attached and they're just sitting out in the sun until they fall apart because the vines are so heavy that I can't go through and pull it all out of them. Um, so, but they were low yielding because they were in a good part of the garden. They had all, everything that they needed. They didn't need to flower. So those are uh, the, the, the tropical type cowpeas that you're gonna let grow real big. Put them in the worst place you have and they'll take off. Um, back to the Three Sisters. Seminole pumpkin's a pretty solid one to put as your pumpkin. Do them on the south side of it so they get the most full sun. Um, trucker's favorite, and then like a semi-vining cowpea. You do the corn a couple weeks later, you interplant with cowpeas, and then you start your pumpkins whenever, because they're kind of just filling out the front of that planting. Does that answer it a little bit at least? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, I, I try to, the, I think the three sisters, or the two sisters that I like the most is cowpeas and cassava, because it's just like, mwah, perfect as far as timing, um, because they are literally sh sh shadowing out the ground as you're picking the last of the cowpeas off, the kind of climbing through the cassava. So, who? Someone be assertive and just say, <laughs> just ask a question. <laughs> I just haven't had success with them. I've got rabbits like you wouldn't believe. So a lot of times this stuff is really tough to protect. Uh, amaranth that I grew for grain, I felt like it, like uh, just the processing versus the like, like I was like saying, like it's like sifting sand. Like by the time you get it all out of those big seed heads, you're like, you know, like there's a little bit of grain, you know, like a corn where you just rip it off and it makes a pound of seed instantaneously. It's kind of nice. Yeah. 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 The so the the sorghum that I grew was a Chinese variety uh, called Bai Bai Yi Kui. It's a three hyphen word. It's a it's a tough one to pronounce for me. Um, and that's a like a perennial type. And I experimented with taking the seed heads off of them after like every songbird in like two square miles had like ravaged them. Um, I gave them to my chickens as is because I was like, well, if I can just like cover these with like a netting or like one of those like uh, those like bags that you put on like I put them on guavas so the stuff doesn't get into them um if I can just store them as is and then just feed them directly without having to do that it works perfect I just need to get it, figure out when to cover them up um and I just need to dedicate some more space to them I grew out seed for it I've got like a pound of seed for it I need to mess around with but I don't have it I haven't cycled through enough times to go like yes this is easy this is how you process it everything like that I'm hoping if I use it as a chicken feed like I was saying I can store it on the heads and then just bundle them up, throw them in the shed, and then just feed as is. That'd be fantastic. So, yeah. And millet, the same thing. I got them to come up, and then they just got ravaged by birds. So I grew a dwarf sorghum and a millet before. So, yeah. They're a uh, uh, same planting cycle as corn. Start them in March. Get them done before it gets too hot. So I have two questions. Yes. First one, I want to go back to the cassava. Yes. You said to cut, like, a piece with eight. Yeah, seven, eight, something like that. So you plant that whole thing. Yes. Horizontally. Yes. Uh, I, like I, said, I was saying, I, like, take, I take just like a pick. Because again, like they're, they don't need much love to really succeed. Um, so um, I store them whole because I find what happens is they'll dehydrate at the top and the bottom if you cut them up. So if you cut them up into little like ready to plant size pieces, you'll find that that eight nodes became four over the winter because the ends dried out. So I just literally just take these and bundle them up and throw them next to a tree. I don't, this is like real, real low tech. And uh, so I'll leave them like this until March, cut them up, let them sit for like a day so they're just a little bit dried off and then plant them. Um, you, yeah, yeah. And that's what all the ones that are, well, it's nice when you lean them up against a tree because they'll root at the bottom and then you can kind of just tear them out. Cause I used to just put them in like the carport and it's like, they're not rooting in concrete, okay, so, so yeah. 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 <laughs> so, yeah, I'll take them. And like I said, they uh, it says six, seven, eight, something like that. You can do bigger, you can do shorter. Uh, there's like a mini way of doing it where you can actually get them to push roots from like every node that you put in the ground. Usually it just comes from like one, it seems like. Um, and just put them in like 45 degree angle. You can lay them flat and they come up. They look like really a weird bush when you do them like that instead of like a more columnar thing. Um, so, yeah, I usually just kind of... I know there's like a bunch of different ways that people do it, but I also have done the same way and had great success every single year. So it's a, it's, it's an ain't broke, don't fix it kind of thing. The other thing I want to ask is about the peanuts. Mm -hmm. You said they don't care about the moisture. 
in the beginning. You got to get them to germinate. So you get, when you get peanut seed, they're in the shell still usually. You shell them out, you plant them, and they're a big oily seed. I mean, they're peanuts, so they're, they're, uh, they really need good soil moisture before they really start germinating cons it, uh, consistently. So I plant everything on drip tape. And I'll, I'll put them on drip tape, but like a foot off the drip tape because they don't need much moisture. But what I found was if I do that without any kind of overhead watering and just like let them go, it's like one comes up here, one comes up here. It's real spotty. Um, so what I, what I did was I, uh, in, in like my regular garden, this like just like row gardens, I took a, uh, this, I used 40 foot rows. So I made a 40 foot mist bar basically. So I took little tiny plug uh, drip emitters and put them every few feet. So it makes just like a cloud of mist over an area. It's a really good thing to do. I only need to do it in the big end of the spring, beginning of the summer before it starts raining a lot because you get like an even moisture. So like if you're trying to germinate like carrots and stuff like that that needs like really wet soil basically, it's a good way of doing that. I'm on a well too, so I'm not paying for water. So I tend to be a little sloppy with it, so. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, you don't have to worry about it then. I'm on a sand hill. It's, it, it, if it doesn't rain, I can dig down three foot and it's just say, bone dry. Yeah. Yeah, I've got a, yeah. <laughs> I don't have that problem or, 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 that, or the benefit of that either. So, no. Nope, sand. Go, go, go up to um, where they grow potatoes up at Hastings or in the Panhandle or up in the Suwannee River Valley where they grow a lot of peanuts, there's no irrigation. They'll, they'll put the, the big bar mister out for a while to get them going and then they're on their own. They're, 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 and, they're, and if you look at that soil, it's not rich black whatever, you know, it's just regular Florida sand. So, you know, they don't need a whole lot. They're a pea, they're making their own nitrogen. They don't need a lot of phosphorus or, or anything either. So if you have like relatively decent garden soil, they will do just fine. So yeah, great ground cover in the summer. It's like, I feel like I did sun hemp and all these other like useless ground covers for so long in the uh, summer. And now I'm like, no, pe te team peanut for sure. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, pick one that's on the shorter side. Cause then you don't have to dedicate as much garden space to it. Um, but it really doesn't matter. I've grown a few weird ones and I've grown normal ones and I've grown some commercial hybrid types. And like I said, they don't, the yield versus the space versus production versus hardiness of the plants didn't seem particularly different. Um, the runner type ones apparently are a little more res uh, resistance to pest and stuff because they're not growing up. So they're growing out more. I could see why that's helpful. But uh, yeah, I've grown them side by side. I grew one that's a North Carolina state developed and put out like two years ago. And I grew one that's 150 years old right next to each other. And I went like, went like this and there was peanuts just the same on both of them. So yeah. <clears throat> uh, I use uh, floating row covers. Yeah. <clears throat> Rab me and rabbits have a, uh, you know, not the greatest relationship at this point. So it's, uh, I, I have to do, ro I have to do row covers on anything. If you have a small garden, there's an English company called Hacksnicks that make these row covers that if you garden by yourself, they've got the stakes built into them. So you can literally just stick one at the end of the row and then just pull it across the row, stick it in, then just put all the other ones in. I garden by myself for the most part, and it's really easy to deploy. So any brassicas, any any rabbit candy that goes out in the garden gets covered for a couple weeks now. And that's uh, been a, a definite game changer because it used to be like, I'm going to cover everything in cayenne pepper and then put up a fence that I cobbled together out of chicken wire and it's just getting cut by wire and it's just miserable. So yeah, those things are pretty great. Not cheap though, but they're... <laughs> I got a 14-year-old dachshund. That's not happening. <laughs> So you mentioned chick, uh, chickpeas. What do, you, what do you think about growing them? I'm growing them right now. I'm growing. Uh, so there's a uh, winter. I'm trying to find a, a bean that grows well over the winter. So I'm growing lup, uh, lupini beans, fava, and then chickpeas right now. I grew fava the last year, and I grew fava years and years ago, and I had the same issue every single time. They get to flower, and uh, there's like a rot that they get, and they don't produce beans. Um, that's the downside, but like when we lived in Orlando, Clemens Produce in the in the in the winter, they have locally grown fava beans here. Like I know somebody grows them in Florida, I just don't know how to grow them yet. And then the lupini is pretty cool, which I'm hoping 
kind of fills in that fava timeline, um, but makes kind of a more something different that's hardier. And same thing with garbanzos. Garbanzos need hot dry for a long time, which there's no time of the year that is that. So um, that's the downside with them. They're growing great. They're a weird looking plant. They look like a carrot top almost. Yeah, they're kind of cool. I, I want I want them to work out, but I don't. Again, I don't have success enough to say like, oh yeah, plant them definitely. Um, with the uh, neutral pigeon pea, would you say that would be good for just chop and dropping? It's a tiny little plant. Oh, okay. So if you want to grow them real dense, and then just it would be like growing sun hemp. Oh, okay. You know what I mean? Like it's it's they're four foot tall, five foot tall. The one that I got from Puerto Rico got maybe five foot tall at the most, and then the ones that uh, Kelly, Kelly and Ryan grew said they about the same. So, we'll see. Piggybacking off of that, yeah. I bought grocery store pigeon peas. Yeah. I planted them. It grew 12 foot yeah. in like three months yeah. and then flowered. Yeah. Is that the same thing? Yeah. <laughs> all all cow, pea, cow peas are cow peas. Or you'd say no, pigeon no, peas are cow peas. Oh, this guy's, yeah. 12 foot. Yeah, that's, that's what mine are right now. I mean, they were until the frost, so oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, they're and they're, they got a tree trunk on them after a while too, and you can keep you can let them go like four or five years, but they get like a little haggard, and then yeah, when you pull that root out, it is, it, it's 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 timbering. It's not just like cutting out chop and drop, you know. So yeah, I usually let them go like two three years, and then pull them. David, you ever messed with uh, the jungle peanuts? Uh, yes, somebody just gave me seed from them, so yeah, I'm growing them this summer. Um, they were grown in Eustis, so I'm almost certain that they'll grow here fine. So, yeah. Um, that's a, it's a, di it's a different arachis species that makes a big, like, primordial peanut. It makes, it's like, it's like lumpy, and it's very, very cool looking, and it has stripes on the actual peanuts themselves. Does it taste the same? I have no idea. I, I've got a little tiny bit, and <laughs> I'm not eating them until I have, like, a lot. <laughs> so, that's, uh, yeah, that's, I'm gonna, I'm gonna grow them side by side. Oh, what's cool about peanuts, too, is because all Fabaceae is in in breeding basically, you don't have to space them out real far and get pretty much pure seed off too. So if you want to save seed, it's only like 20, 30 foot. So if you got raised beds out front, grow some seed for next year in them and you got some out back, do that too. So that's uh, kind of the nice thing with uh, all the beans in general. And I'll even say that with the pigeon peas, I have two distinct varieties that I originally started with and now a lot of them are kind of halfway, but like most of them are still very distinct. Like it's like a darker one and a lot, actually you can see, this is from this year. So there's a lot less light ones, but the light ones that are in here have a little bit of brown in them too. They all taste the same. They all cook up the same. So yeah, that's what matters ultimately, so. Anybody else got questions, anything? Hopefully that wasn't just like a whirlwind and confusing more so, so. <laughs> Yeah.